Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery, and it's brought to you by our friends at knowyourscript.org. We love and appreciate those guys, because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be able to do this podcast weekly. Go check them out, knowyourscript.org. I'm Casey Scott. That is Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist and student body president of class of 1999. 90. 90. 90, 90, 90. 90. Yeah. And How old are you? you were, I'll I'm take bef- 41. I'm 41. But before that, you were kind of just regaling us with all your- uh, Oh, shut up. I, mean, you I were, was not. You, you, you got a full-ride scholarship as a D1 I school. I never had a full-ride scholarship. No, you're just making up stories. Did you have a scholarship? Yeah. Partial scholarship? Yeah. To a D1 school? Sure. I mean, I mean you're well-read. I mean, you, you're probably the most interesting man in Salt Lake City. <laughs> Oh, you need to get out more, buddy. No, I really do. But I really do love and and enjoy talking to you. I mean, it's because your perspective on life, and I think that's why people really like this podcast, is because you are the yin to my raging yang. You know what I mean? I think we work well together, but but for sure- this is the Casey Scott show. People no, the, love no, I, connecting with you. And I don't think your it story. works with, with anybody but you. Well, thanks. I because here's that. the deal: when I try to explain people about the podcast, what Project Recovery is all about, you know, I, I give them the standard: it's about recovery, addiction, but more importantly, it's about recovery. Yeah. And I go. The crazy thing is, is that I can tell you what an addict's thinking because I have an addict brain. I can tell you all the stuff that's going on, how you can rationalize and justify. You can do this and do things you never thought you would do and all that stuff. And Dr. Matt can break it down and go, well, here's actually what's happening. Your brain is doing this and you're doing this and you're compensating for this. And so, I mean, you bring a saneness to my madness. Well, thank you. I, I mean, that is, I think we have fun together and we do work well together. I will tell you this, though. Yeah. I think the real stars of the show are the people that sit in that seat over there because that's really what's exciting for people to keep. The people who keep tuning in, I mean, let's face it, as entertaining as the two of us can be. Yeah. They've had a lot of us. Right. But I, so I think they enjoy listening to us. But I think the real stars of the show are our guests. And that's why we created this podcast is because when I was in recovery and I was going to those 12-step meetings and I was listening to people's stories, that's where I really found, uh, you know, the fight for recovery. It's like, Mm -hmm. and and not to be like, but I said this often, I go, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And and so that was kind of what this podcast is. Let's showcase recovery in all its different forms. And so we've had uh, pornography, we've had heroin, we've had Ritalin, we've had... uh, Marijuana, we've had, whatever you've had, it we've had it on here, and other mental health issues as well. Yeah, and so we wanted to be able to talk about it in an open forum. And the reason I, I, I like talking with you when I said you bring saneness to my madness is right now the world is crazy. Yeah, I mean it, it really is. I, I mean yeah. there's there's so many different things going on, and we've said this for probably the past eight months that the next pandemic is going to be mental health. Yeah, no, I feel like it's already started. There are a lot of. Inc- Across the board in mental health categories, we're seeing a, a spike in problematic behavior and issues. Yeah. So what can we do to kind of uh, get ahead of that? I mean, I, I know we're playing catch up now, but what can we do if somebody's listening to this? I mean, what are some signs? What are some things people could be looking for? That they go, hey, maybe I should see a therapist or maybe I need to talk to somebody because there is a lot of isolation that's going on right now with the pandemic, with COVID and, and people locking themselves up and working from home. Yeah. So there is a lot of isolation. There is a lot of that. Um, and I would... Definitely encourage people to reach out whether you want to just touch base with somebody who does something like life coaching and you feel like you need a little boost in your motivation Mm -hmm. or maybe more importantly, work with an actual mental health therapist and things like that. But as you were saying that, what came to my mind was a conversation I had yesterday with this, uh, I'll call him a kid, but he's almost 30 and he came in to visit with me and I've known him for a long time and he had just uh, recently broken up with a girlfriend And part of his analysis of why that happened was that they had grown in different directions during the COVID pandemic so far. And he felt like, and I think he's right, that for for her, she kind of gave up. Like this is overwhelming and she shut down and she kind of started to see how she can't do things that she had wanted to do prior to the pandemic. She was seeing all the the roadblocks in her way. Uh And this kid who's not by any means like a natural optimist like you are uh he said that one day in his apartment there he was he just said i'm going to make this work for me like i that this is this is different it's not what i planned on all this like 
going online and his type of schooling. He's in college, like, you know, didn't really work easily online and all these sorts of things. But he said, I just made a commitment to myself that I was going to find ways to actually thrive during this change. And he was giving examples of his friends that he have either gone one way or the other. And so I think what it, it comes down to uh, an attitude and a commitment to yourself. Like, what is your attitude about these challenges? It's not easy. I, I think I've told you before on the show, like, uh, if you'd have asked me before COVID, could, I, could online therapy be effective? I was very down on that idea, but I'm not anymore because it works great. And you know what? My quality of life's a little bit higher because three days a week I get to be home in between patients. I can check on the dogs or make my kid do their homework or whatever it is. It's mm-hmm. kind of nice to be home. And people who used to have to travel an hour to get to me in an hour back home, take work off, take school off, all those things have changed. So there's benefit inside the change. And so if you look at it as change, Instead of fighting it, if you have the attitude of my friend who came in to visit with me yesterday, like, I'm just going to find out how to make this work for me. And honestly, he's killing it. He's doing great with his mental health. He's thriving in school, almost finished. Like, he's really, you know, lived up to that commitment that he made. And he's noticed how his romantic relationship didn't survive it because he felt like it was too overwhelming for her. So she needs help. Hope she gets some There are a lot of people out there that are feeling overwhelmed. I hope you'll reach out and get some help. If you feel like you're in the middle somewhere, consider making a commitment to make it work for you. And I don't know what that looks like for everybody because everyone's life is different. Yeah. But there are ways to make school, relationships, work. You can adjust, adapt, and survive instead of just kind of feel like your life's on hold during this time. While we were waiting for you, I was talking to our guest, (laughs) uh, Whitney Duncan, and she said something. She goes, I I think everything happens for a reason. And you hear that a lot in the recovery world. And you also hear it is what it is in the recovery world. It is what it is. Now, I love those sayings and I hate those sayings. I love those sayings because it is what it is. is, It's simple. Yeah. And everything happens for a reason. But you still got to have choice in those things that happen. It is, you know. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I. So I'm kind of like you. I sort of like and sort of dislike those sayings. Um, but the second one, the everything happens for a reason. I like that if you add um, and you can choose the reason. Like that's like the, that's, that's, the, the, that's you know exactly what I, mean? what I told Whitney. I was yeah. like I was like I like that, but the but the reality is is you had a choice. You could either stay in the situation yeah. or you could learn from it and make it better. Cuz most things in life have an upside and a downside, a right. positive and a negative, right? And uh-huh. the optimist usually sees the opportunity and the pessimist usually sees the roadblock. And unless it is risking your life or limb or some other tremendously life altering situation, you're always better off. And research backs me up on this, choosing the optimistic point of view. If you're like, I mean, I can make this job change. I didn't want this job change. I'm working from home now or or I lost my job, but I can make this work for me. So everything happens for a reason. I get to choose what that reason's going to be. Yes. Then I really like that saying. And, and, and it sounds like the guy you visited yesterday said, I'm, I'm going to make this. Oh, I'm so impressed with him. I mean, you That's got to make your heart feel good when yeah. you see it click with somebody. Yeah, yeah. I'm just so impressed. Lots of, and of course, he's had tons of challenges, but has really thrived in this time, which if you knew him like I do, it was like, oh, I don't know. How's this going to go? Because this has been hard on a lot of people's mental health, people who struggle with depression. This has been a super big challenge, but- Obviously, there's examples of people who've made it work for them. And that podcast shows you those examples. This podcast does because we show you examples Mm -hmm. week in and week out of people who come in and have changed their lives for the better. We're going to introduce you to Whitney in just a few seconds. She's going to tell you about her story and what she's doing now. She's a wonderful person. I can't wait to hear her story. You're listening to Project Recovery right here on KSL. Hey, welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. Our guest today is Whitney Duncan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Now, we've been trying to plan this for uh, about... A month and a half, two months. Right, right. Uh, and we thought you had to come in, and then you said, "Oh crap, I'm turning forty. I'm going to Mexico." <laughs> right. And uh, in the elevator up, I said, "How was Mexico? How was it?" It was amazing. And you went to uh, an all inclusive. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, when I hear all inclusive, back in the old day, I could do a damage to a bar. 
You know what I mean? That's all you can drink for free. And I, you know what I mean? You had the Michael Scott look in your eye. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, it's all inclusive. I was like, oh, let's do this. You know what I mean? <laughs> They're going to come up to me afterwards and go, wow, we're so impressed. So I've never been to an all inclusive resort. I am going to go in a month or so. Mm-hmm. But what you're, so what does that mean? Like, can you just eat and drink everything you want? Yeah. It's all paid for? Yep. Wow. It, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a It's like glutton. a cruise. Yeah, oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, it, 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 it's crazy. But for somebody like me who was in active addiction for 30 years and loved to party, th- those, that was music, dangerous, music huh? to my ears. I mean, yeah. it, we're, we're, we're talking about shots in the morning. Do you remember any of those resorts? Uh, most of them. <laughs> bits and pieces. It, it yeah. becomes, I mean, that's kind of sad, actually, right? Because it, it's a lot of fun stuff there. But when you go there and you just drink it, day drinking and drinking all the time, start the day with a cocktail i mean you probably don't remember a lot of the the events so whitney your addiction was to what um painkillers heroin meth crack wow i mean that i mean and i mean that that, that that's a pretty impressive yeah all the big the ones list, yeah but but wasn't alcohol no and so when you go to an all-inclusive uh, resort like this, w- was it fun? Was it, I mean, w- in your sober life, was it was it a good time? You know, I feel like I have more fun in my sober life than I ever did partying. It's crazy, right? 100%. Mm-hmm. And you thought just because you were partying, you were having fun. I remember one time uh, when my active addiction, my mom was like, this is BS. And I go, what? And she goes, you're out there partying, having a good time, and we're all paying for it. And I was like, I'm not having fun. I don't know if you know this, but right. It, 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 right now I'm not having fun. I'm doing whatever I can just to get Stay to a baseline. Well. But yeah. don't you think a lot of people in their active addiction, at least for a while, it, it they kind of make it look fun. Yes. And, and Appealing, everyone's running yeah. around picking up the pieces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, if I do this, I can drink more. And what? Yeah. And it, I mean, it, it's, it's but a, what's going on inside the person's different than what you exactly. see. Oh, it's just a maddening outside. world. Mm-hmm. Well, let's find Let me out. ask a question, though, because I don't want—I don't, I don't want to jump to conclusions. I think you and I and most people, we sometimes jump to conclusions where um, we assume that sobriety for everybody means 100 percent no substances. Yeah. And we know that that's not necessarily true. That's not everyone's definition of sobriety. And I'm not here to tell you what the right definition is. So I'm just kind of curious, since you've never had experience with alcohol, do you feel comfortable or not experience uh, uh, an addiction to alcohol? Do you feel comfortable drinking alcohol or is that not on your list? Um, I don't know. I I don't really want to take the chance, honestly, yeah. because I I feel like it might give me. And it, maybe it's because I've heard in the rooms of recovery that, you know, if I take a drink, it it could lead me back to, you know, the right. my DLC. Other, and I agree with that. I think that's... Um, that's why I didn't take that cough syrup. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, was like, right. I didn't yeah. even want to open that door. Yeah, and I think that what, what do we know about alcohol? It impairs your judgment. Yeah. And right. so, of course, once you start drinking, even if that's not your DOC, you, if it's never really caused problems for you, it could easily open up you know, the gateway to other poor other decisions things. that lead yeah. back to your addiction. I was just curious because yeah. we've had people come on the show who uh, use yeah, different there's people. Yeah, that like they're that. like, well, I was addicted to, you know, opiates, uh, but I was never addicted to marijuana. marijuana. So I feel comfortable smoking marijuana. I consider myself sober. So it's just, it's interesting because I think we have this sort of black and white version in our heads of what, or everybody has their own definition, I guess. And so I like to hear people come on and talk about what their internal thought process is about what sobriety means to them. And I'll tell you this, and I can't speak for Whitney because my recovery is mine and mine alone. And I do what works for me and it makes sense to me. And it's something that I can sustain and something I believe in and something that I can do. And I've been doing it for over three years. So my recovery is my recovery. I have a problem when somebody comes in and tells me that my recovery is not recovery because you don't know me. Right. And this seems to work for me. I mean, I people's like, hey, if you don't go to the 12 step rooms, you'll never stay sober. You don't know me. And, And that's not a very fair statement. And the statistics don't back that. Oh, and baby. so my recovery is my recovery, and we're going to find out what Whitney's recovery looks like. But before we get to that, where does the story of young Whitney begin? <laughs> so I grew up in a very small town, Roosevelt, Utah, um, to a very loving family, um, great parents. I have um, there's five of us all together. I have three si- three sisters and a brother. Um, where do you where do you rest in that that brood? I'm second to last. Okay. 
Um, and I, growing up, I feel like I was kind of always um, an attention seeker, kind of bouncing off the walls. Like I was into gymnastics at a really young age, so I was like doing flips everywhere and trying to get people to watch me and, you know, because I, I don't know if I didn't feel like I got the attention that I needed, but I feel like that's what I was always trying to get from my family. Which I think a lot of kids are uh, attention seekers. Uh, you know, hey, look yeah, at me. Look at me, mom. Yeah. 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 Sure. And so, but that seems pretty normal. And so you had a pretty good childhood, loving Great parents. Great childhood, yep, yep. Um, uh, I played uh, volleyball and basketball all through high school. Um, did you party at all in high school? Was it just something mm. recreational? Before we get there, Ooh, were you okay. a hyperactive kid? Because you mentioned the flips and the I all was that, a little bit, sports. but not overly. Did you feel restless no. like a lot as a no. kid? No. Okay. No. The reason I ask is a lot of times um, kind of our, our neurobiology sets us up sure. for needing more stimulation than other people. So right. we know some people are kind of thrill seekers, and they may get that energy uh, you know, boost out through something like reckless behaviors and other people might turn to like drugs and alcohol sure. to either calm down or to meet their stimulation needs. So it's not uncommon for kids who are kind of bouncing off the walls to, to be tempted by to turn to that. things. Yeah. Right. But you said in high school, um, you didn't, it didn't look like you partied much or no, not really. In fact, the first time that I even was introduced or saw marijuana was my senior year. Okay. In high school, and that was the first time I smoked it. Um, what was your family culture like around drugs and alcohol? Was that? Um, I my my dad drank a little bit. Um, he doesn't. He isn't one that really talks about that. It's kind of like that kind of stuff happened in my family. Like we shove things under the rug. We don't really talk about it because we wanted to make things on the outside look. Really good, right? So when you said he drank a little bit, was that sort of on the down low? Like, um, no, it, it was like he didn't hide it, but he didn't talk to us kids about it a lot. Oh, okay. So there was no there was no conversation mm -mm. about drinking or mm -mm. anything like that. No, and my grandma had an addiction to uh, prescription drugs. My aunt was an addict, um, so it kind of okay. So there's a little bit of family, family history mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Did anybody talk about? grandma and aunt's addictions or was that also kind of swept under um a little bit a little bit my aunt actually took her life um oh, from oh. it i'm sorry yeah. how, how old were you when that happened oh gosh probably late teens um maybe early 20s i think um how did your family manage that that that's a trauma in a family, and every family sort of approaches their traumas a little differently. I think they handled it pretty well, but again, it was like something that I feel like they didn't want to be associated with because her life was so hard, you know, and she was very dependent on other people, and she was kind of a burden, basically, is how I remember feeling about her. So that, but I connected with her a lot because I, my heart hurt for her, you know, like it just, I, I'm always that type of person that, um, sees somebody that's hurting and I hurt and I want to help and I want to try to make you're things empathic. better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm empathetic and you feel yeah. the emotions of others. Yeah. Yeah. So you could see that your aunt was struggling. You saw that part of mm -hmm. What was going on with her yeah i did but you tried marijuana for the first time your senior year mm -hmm. and you... then got wasted drunk at my senior keg <laughs> and that was the first time that i had really drank um and my boyfriend at the time like we it was up in the uenas and he was looking behind all the trees for me because i would be passed out mm. behind you know just because i and I think that's probably where maybe when I use something and I like the feeling of it, I go all in. So you liked that feeling. That I season. did. I did. But I didn't like the after. I didn't like the after. 
and and so it was just kind of a sporadic drinking thing that kind of happened after that so after high school where does Whitney go well I graduated and I was in a relationship with my ex-husband um, and we it was just kind of rocky so I came home and told my mom that I I wanted to leave and so after I graduated I she said okay let's go and I wanted to do hair so we went and looked at um, a school in Provo, and I moved out there and started school. And he went to Price um, CEU redshirt football mm -hmm. down there. And so we kind of took a break, but ended up kind of getting back together. Um, he was smoking weed at the time, and but was hiding it from me. And like when he would meet up with me, I'd find like the little seeds and stuff in his car, and he would try to make excuses for it. So it was kind of on and off with him. And then um, he, we both moved back to Roosevelt after. Um, he actually moved back because he was using all the money his dad was giving him to buy weed and selling it. So he had to move back. I moved back because I finished beauty school. And then we ended up getting back together and getting married at 20. At 20. The ripe 20. old age of 20. <laughs> I know. I think back now, I'm like, that's so young. But in small towns, I that's mean, that, the normal that thing. happens, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty common. You're, yeah, that's what a you lot do. Of my, I, I grew up in a small town. A lot of my classmates got married, you know, in 18, 19, 20 years old. It's, yeah, it's not that uncommon. So you move back to Roosevelt. You get married. You start cutting hair. Mm -hmm. uh, what does your uh, ex-husband or husband do at the time? He was working in the oil field, and he continued to do that all through our marriage. And I, same, I did the hair. And that was pretty good money. I mean, working really in the oil field money. is really good money. But Hard work. Especially when you're 20 and all of a sudden you have all this cash, and right? And that was the thing. Um, I think that played a part in our addiction. Um, we made a lot, a lot of money at a young age really fast. But you said uh, your addiction was opioids, heroin, meth, and crack. How do you go from cutting hair in a small town to that? To that. We're going to find out what that is in just a few seconds. You're listening to Project Recovery right here on KSL. Welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. Our guest today is Whitney Duncan. Uh, we're going to find out how she makes the jump from marijuana to the hard stuff. But I think I think kind of the setting, reviewing the stage here, she brings up such a good point and that we've had several guests say the exact same thing. That's sort of a dangerous combination. Being young and not having a lot of responsibilities, but having a lot of money. Oh, yeah. So, like, all of a sudden, you're not- Look at Justin Bieber. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that, that's a little more money than I think right. she's talking about, but, but I don't know. But it's the same thing. I mean, that they, guy all of a sudden was yeah. thrust into the stardom, had a- crap ton of money and nobody told him no yeah, and who could right anyway so like when you're a kid you make poor decisions he just was able to make more expensive poor decisions so let me ask you this whitney you and your husband in your 20s married up in roosevelt he's working in the oil field you're cutting hair making really good money you i assume i don't know what your parents but you're probably making comparable money to what your parents were making uh, i don't know comparable my dad makes pretty good money in the oil field but um we were, for us it was more than we probably and, should have. And you didn't have like a lot of you know money going out probably like to bills and stuff. Not at the time when we were first yeah. married, no. Right. No. Nope. So so how do you guys progress from social partying to addict? Well, so after we actually got married in the temple. Um, kind of straightened our lives up and did the LDS that. LDS Church for people that yep, may not yep. know. Yep. I was born and, and raised and Mormon. And to get married in the temple, if you're a Mormon, mm -hmm. you, you you can't just show up. Right. 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 So you have to you have to kind of Attend prove that you're and... you live in all of the the requirements of of the mm -hmm. LDS Church, which would mean no drugs and alcohol. Exactly. Yep. But that's where, um, trying to put on a facade of who. My family wanted me to be who maybe I wanted to be at the time, but wasn't really that person. Um, so I, he 
shortly after we got married, I found out he was still smoking weed. And I tried and tried to, you know, get him to stop. And it just became one of those things, if you can't beat him, join him. And so that's what I did. And, I mean, I was getting up every morning and smoking before I'd go and do a full day of hair. And, um, yeah, and that's basically how it was for about four years. And then um, after four years of marriage, we got pregnant with our first child, Presley. I got a Presley. I know. It's the coolest name. I love it. Name him after Elvis? Yeah. We did too? Yep, yep. (laughs) Um, And that's probably where my love for or introduction to um, pain pills came. Um, Because when you have babies, they give them to you after. And I immediately loved that feeling. Um, And after probably my second daughter, Sophie, was born... um, I shared them with my husband, and and he liked them too. Um, and then um, after, and I don't know if I can say this or not, <laughs> but I'm going to. We enjoyed sex on him. And so then it became something that we looked for or asked friends if they had them you know, or, and, and bought them from people little bits at a time when we could. I think that's really typical. Like that happens all the time with drugs and sex, the combination where, you know, a couple are like, Hey, it's more fun to have sex when we're high in some way. And so Mm -hmm. I don't think that's unusual. But it is the first time it's been said on this podcast. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you that. Is I mean, it, it really is. Okay. But Probably, what I yeah. can tell you, this is where an addict brain comes in. And I can be a benefit to the show. It, it, it's it's part of the ritualistic process. You know what I mean? It's a rationalization. It's a justification for why you're doing those things. Good yeah. point. You know yeah. what I mean? Good point. That yeah. It's like, hey, we're doing this, this thing, our but life. it's helping our sex life. It's and bringing it was, us closer together. If this is bringing us closer together, it can't how, can, be bad. Yeah, how can it be so bad? Yeah, and it was it was fun, and it was something to look forward to. Yeah. Being, you know, parents of... Now you got two kids and I mean, you're actually bringing up a great relationship point and that is that as soon as a couple starts to have children, then life gets more complicated. The business of life sets in yeah. where you might be, you know, paying rent or a mortgage and you're taking care of the kids and you're tired and you know, you don't have all the energy you used to have. And so, uh, an intimacy, intimacy, a sex life that starts to diminish and become sure. less important. Mm-hmm. So I could see how that was kind of tempting for you guys to say oh this helps us stay connected as a yeah, couple yeah so yeah. that led to you guys going around town buying them when you could but it wasn't a full-blown addiction no, at this point this it was, wasn't all the time i wasn't dependent this is just something if we can find it cool and yeah. call your husband and go hey look i got some mm-hmm. this weekend's mm-hmm. gonna be all right yeah date night yeah yeah <laughs> yep until so. there's always the until <laughs> right you know what i mean there, it always <laughs> works until it, it doesn't, doesn't. Yep. yeah yeah So I, um, when I was pregnant with my second daughter, we, um, bought seven acres out in the cove and, um, is that an area in Roosevelt? uh Mm Uh-huh. And, um, we built a home, um, you know, cause we, we could afford it and we built a really nice home on this seven acres. Um, I had my second child, Sophia there. And same thing, the pills, you know, were great. And then um, um, three years later, um, my little Haley came along, and she was a surprise. And we were still using them pretty regularly, but not really dependent on them. Um, After Haley was born, or no, 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 before Haley was born, um, before I got pregnant with her, we were introduced to Oxycontins by a friend, and that's one of the people that we, you know, would look around, and he couldn't find, like, Lord Tabs or anything, but he had these. And that's and a game changer. Much more oh, powerful, right? Oh, gosh. What and was it, the difference like for you when you went from Lord Tabs to Oxycontin? Uh, very intense, and I used them differently. You know, I, I would snort those instead of just swallowing okay. the, the regular ones. Is that ones. immediate... Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and we we would buy an 80, um, an 80 Oxycon. That's one pill. That's one pill. 80 milligrams. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And we would, we could make that last probably <laughs> three weeks because we would only use on the weekends at this time. Um, and then... So we started using those pretty regularly. And then, and at that point, we were definitely addicted. We were getting them all, all the time. You know, we had like $30,000 saved in our bank account, and that went real fast. But we were addicted at that point, and I found out I was pregnant with my third child, Haley. And I knew I had to quit. I knew I had to quit because I wasn't going to do that to my baby. So, um, and I was very upset. I cried and cried when I found out I was pregnant. Um, Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. And I don't know how to say this. Was the saddest part about that that you weren't able to use the pills or that you weren't expecting a baby? Does that make sense? Both. Both. 100% both. Because I knew that I had to give that up. And I've, I'd heard stories about, you know, coming off of them. And, the withdrawals. Yeah, and it scared me. I was terrified. Um, so um, when I told my family I was pregnant, um, I was not only dealing with morning sickness, but I was dealing with the withdrawals, right, too. And double whammy. Double whammy. But my family had no idea I was withdrawing. They just thought my morning sickness. It's the worst morning sickness of all time. Yeah, and it was horrible. It was so bad. And you just did that at home on your own? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. Just white knuckled it. Just white knuckled it. And I quit all through my pregnancy. But once she was born, it started back up again. Your husband at the time, did he quit while you were pregnant or did he keep using it? Yes, he did as far as I know. Yeah. Okay, so he tried to show a little solidarity there. Yeah, yeah. Was it affecting... His work life and the no, ability to nope, and you know. working in the oil field. There's a lot of drugs in the oil field too. So sure. there, you know, you can. In fact, there was a lot of times that we would get stuff from people he knew in the oil field. Sure. Um, but once uh, Sophia was born, so Haley. So when Haley was born, my baby, that I quit while I was pregnant with her. Um, again, you get you get them after you have a baby. And that kind of started it back up, and then, you know, obviously that wasn't what we were used to, so. Did you even contemplate taking them? Because I hear you are, you've, you've successfully detoxed and gotten off of them. No, actually I didn't. I didn't. That baby was more important to me at the time. No, I mean, sure. but did you even oh. contemplate um, taking the pain pills again that they gave you after the pregnancy? No. <laughs> nuh <Nuh-uh. laughs> <laughs> no, like I, I, you knew it was coming. I knew They're it was gonna coming. Them, I'm going to take them. Yeah. And I loved them. I literally had a true love for them. And I still say that to this day that that was my true love was opiates. Um, Isn't that interesting how you can make such a personal connection with something like a drug? Because I've heard that a lot of times from people. I, mm-hmm. I've heard people even with something as simple as like a cigarette they'll say like you know that that's the brand that i used to smoke and they'll right. they'll get that you know loving eye, look a in feeling, their eyes like yeah. oh yeah i remember right. you know marble yeah. mediums yeah <laughs> i loved smoking yeah i was good at it and i really enjoyed it i mean i'm, I'm I, was I, that your choice that marble was it. Medium? oh yeah. yeah and uh i mean i yeah. i'm probably the only guy that you know went to rehab and doesn't come out smoking because i was like i'm not going to do it <laughs> because i mean it just it, just go from one to the other. Yeah. Yeah. I had a conversation with a guy who was in his eighties one time and he had started smoking homemade rolled up cigarettes with his brothers when they worked in the fields when he was about six years old. And when he was in his forties, he finally quit smoking. So he'd smoked, you know, almost 40 years. Wow. And he said to this day, if he smells that tobacco, it just, he gets this feeling of like happiness because he was with his brothers and they, you know, it's yeah. all those and it's nostalgia the and, stuff that and the memories. With the but of course, just like everything, it works until it doesn't eventually. Well, we remember it, the yeah. good does memories and we, we compartmentalize the bad memories. <laughs> right. right. Addicts get really good at doing that. <laughs> yes. So after your third child, you get back on pain pills, but they're not the ones you love because you've already been introduced to Oxycontin. Yeah. So you can't, you can't revert back to that if you're a true addict. 
Um, so we immediately got back on those and like I I nursed all my babies and Haley like I I nursed them all for about a year and Haley the poor little thing <laughs> I could see her just she was asleep all the time and so I couldn't do that um so I quit nursing her because that's the better way I can quit nursing her and still continue to do what I want to do. Because she was getting effects from the... Absolutely. Especially, I mean, you know, the doctors say it's okay with Lortab and stuff, but Oxycontin, that's a little too much. And so you'd notice that in her. I can tell that's really hard for you still to yeah. think about that. Yeah, well, you'll hear later. I put my kids through quite a bit. So, um, then... When my family first found out about my addiction, um, you know, this whole time I'm I'm snorting pills and going to church on Sunday, putting on, you know, living this double life, um, pretty functionable, you know, it wasn't too bad. Um, and then my family wanted, um, it was my dad's birthday, and he wanted all of us to go to the temple with him for his birthday. And... I, I was, I was going to go actually. And my husband at the time, he's like, no, we can't do that. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to tell my family? And so at that point in time, I came out to my family about my addiction and, um, being the amazing humans that they are, they rallied around me and tried to get me some help. Um, and that's where I joined the church's 12-step program. That was my first um, first introduction to recovery. any type of recovery. Right. Um, and so we did that. Um, but we, we would go to these meetings, but we were still using pills, you know, and it... Um, Do you feel like you were, were, when you came out to your family that was obviously because you felt like you had to because of the it was coming to a head on everybody going to the temple mm -hmm. and for those people who don't know you have to have a recommend a, a, and in, i wasn't worthy i was and not you worthy. couldn't say i'm worthy because you were violating that, that well and to be honest i probably would have had to go and renew my mm -hmm. temple recommend and to go in and tell the bishop there's no way i could renew it yeah, so so if you're going to be honest with the bishop, then you wouldn't be able to go to the temple. Right. So that so was I might as well just tell instead your, of tell the bishop, I'll just tell my tell family. your family. But my question is, um, were you open? Were you kind of hoping for some recovery at that moment, uh, or do you feel like you were just agreeing to go to the twelve step for again to kind of you know do the thing that makes the family happy? I think so. I think I was just going through the actions. For sure. Because that's kind of the, a lot of people's family style is we sweep things under the rug. We kind of want to have the, uh, the pretense of competency. We want to look good in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to rock the boat. It's dad's birthday. Let's just <laughs> tell everybody yes. Right. And make everybody happy. But if you aren't wanting to be there, then what was your experience like in that 12-step program? Well, she said they were using throughout it. Yeah, we were using throughout it. So mm -hmm. we were just going through the motions. But you didn't get converted to that. It sounds like you were just kind of going to go. Just going to go. Yeah. Yep. And then, um, but we did, however, get to a point where um, we decided to try to quit, but we got on Suboxone, which is just basically a crutch um it's very addicting in itself it's supposed to be an intermediary step right, right right but it was being the addicts that we were we were abusing that as well um and so we kind of you know when you get on suboxone the doctor will drug test you and make sure you know that you're not doing anything else and we started stopped using suboxone and got kind of off that program with the doctor um, but we would still, like, if we couldn't find any pills, we would, you know, somebody had Suboxone around and that would get us by and keep us well until we could find what we really wanted. Um, and then, uh, we got, 
we found this a dealer that um, could get you anything you wanted at any time. He was the Walmart of dealers. Yep. <laughs> and we were buying. So Oxy's kind of went from the the ones you could crush up to the ones that had like a coating on it that you couldn't crush up. So we're like, eh, we don't really want to do that. We like to snort them, right? And so we went back or we started using Oxy 30s quite heavily. We were buying at $40 a pop, we were buying like 30 pills a week. Wow. If you think your alcohol issue was expensive, try that. I mean, that would bankrupt most people pretty quickly. I mean, I'm trying to do the math, but that's what, 12000 Yeah. $12,000 a, a week. Well, right? I don't know. I don't remember what the number is. It's a lot were, of money. It's a lot of money. Either way. Yeah. <laughs> and so you were doing that, and uh, that kept you going for about how long? Well, um, when my... So I we were using them really heavy, and... Um, I started to not start feeling very well. I had this raging headache that would just not go away, right? And I'm like, what the heck? Like, I'm taking all these pain meds, and I still have this headache that just wouldn't go away. And I was working all the time, pretty exhausted, but I was also a mother of, you know, three young kids working five days a week doing hair. Just thought it was normal. Um, Until I... um, I finally decided this. There's something wrong. I need to go and see what's going on. Through a, a few series of events, my family said you really need to go see a doctor. So I went in to the doctor, and being self-employed, we didn't have insurance, and the doctor ordered some blood tests to be done. And I almost walked out of that hospital and didn't because I didn't want to pay for it. I'd rather spend my money you on, know, drugs. on drugs. But something led me to get that blood work done. So that was a Tuesday. And on Thursday, I go back in to see the doctor. And I was diagnosed, diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Oh, wow. And ended up in Huntsman at midnight that day. Wow. And so that brought on a whole new demon. I was prescribed 150, 30 oxys a month and 180 milligram morphine a month. Wow. Wow. That is incredible. Plus the shock of being told you have cancer. Yeah. I had no idea that's that's what they were going to tell me. Yeah. No idea. We're going to find out where this goes in just a few seconds. You're listening to Project Recovery right here on KSL. Welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. Our guest, Whitney Duncan, just revealed that she was diagnosed with cancer. She went from spending, I think it was $1,200 a week on OxyContin 30s to finding out they're giving her 150 a month and morphine as well. And you said that's when it brought on a whole different demon. What did you mean by that? Well, um, at, up to that point, we basically, you know, had ran through all the money that we had. And so we, um, I was being prescribed them and, um, you know, we'd use them and use them. And I was sharing, obviously, with my husband and... Um, and then when we'd run out, we'd obviously go and, and buy, but then, you know, we come up with this grand idea, you know, I could just sell these. And so that's what we started to do. Um, and then one day we ran out and we were looking everywhere for something just cause we were sick. Right. And, um, so my, and I didn't really know a lot of people I did, but he was, my ex-husband was always the one that knew more of the connects, so he was always the one looking around. And he couldn't find anything. Um, He's like, but I know somebody that has black. And black is heroin. Heroin. Black tar heroin. Mm Mm-hmm. 
And I said, absolutely not. Like, to me, that sounded like the trashiest drug. Like, I, I'm not going there. But I did because that's the only thing we could get. And I was so sick. I mean, you can imagine doing all the pills I was doing. and You'd what, be so dope sick, right? So dope mm-hmm. sick. Oh, and you had cancer, too. Yeah. Yeah. All, well, the, all the while you're trying to get, were you doing okay, cancer so, treatments? So I got to go back. So the heroin didn't start until after I got back from, so I, I was admitted to the hospital, um, for six weeks, went through intense chemo, um, you know, lost all my hair, all that stuff. I had to have a bone marrow transplant. All that took some time. It took a while to find a donor. Um, but I finally got my transplant and I had to live within 30 minutes of the hospital after my transplant in case something happened. I was close to Huntsman, right? So we we had a really good friend that was kind and generous that opened up his home and let us stay in this um, apartment that he had. So my super awesome mom, she was, she was there with me during all the week um, at the hospital and at this place that I had to stay. Um, Spencer was at home working, taking care of the kids. My sisters took on the kids while he was at work and, and he was still using, you know, during that time. And, and he, that's, I think where he started actually to use heroin, like without me knowing. And so when he told me about the heroin, like it was something he was already been, uh, yeah, yeah. but, and I was like, uh, -uh. um, but anyway, so. Um, he would come out on the weekends, bring the kids out and, you know, I'd give him some of my pills and I had to back up because that this was before we started using heroin. But when I found out it, he was using heroin, he would come out and we would share, you know, my pills that I had. Um, and all of a sudden he's like, no, you keep them like you need them more than I do. And I'm like. And he's like, I got some from back home. But that's what he was doing, you know. Anyway, and so um, I get back home um, from my transplant and everything. And um, my husband, I was still pretty sick, um, but I had... I was feeling okay enough, but I was still on not doing chemo, but I had to take a chemo pill. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wasn't like 100%. Anyway, the oil field crashed at that time, and my husband loses his job. And so he loses his job in addiction, and he basically becomes somebody I don't even know. Just lays on the couch. and we still had bills to pay. You know, we had this home that we had just built. We had two really nice cars. Um, and it's starting to scare me. Like, we're going to lose everything, you know. And so um, I told him, you know, this isn't the man that I married. And so I actually went back to work full time just you know not feeling well at all I had a salon in the home and I would wake up and I'd go to work and I'd work a full day and come back in the house and he'd still be on the couch my kids would still be in their pajamas the house was a wreck and just like he was I was losing him you know and I was going to lose everything and anything you know and I could see it coming and so that's when I had the conversation with him about, you know, like either you make some changes or I got to go, you know. So he did. He um, found a job actually out in Ogden. And um, that's so he actually moved out to Ogden. I stayed here or back in Roosevelt with the kids and we put our house up for sale and we were going to, you know, make it make some changes. Well, he was working out um, in Ogden. I was home. You know, we're still pretty deep in addiction. 
Um, his, his brother is actually a highway patrolman, and his sister was a cop as well out there. <laughs> so anyway, his sister would drive by. So that's so. And you're using heroin. I'm using heroin at this, at time, this time. With a brother and sister-in-law that are both officers. Yes, but okay. I'm not using heroin with them. Not with them, but yes, I mean, yeah, but they are. They're in that's your life. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, we had actually started using a little bit of meth at that time too. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and it's sad because my kids will talk now, and they, they remember me making dinner, and I would be, I would fall asleep making in the middle of making dinner, mm. and they would have to come and wake me up. You know, just just horrible stories. Anyway, so, um, and there was one night that I put my kids to bed, and I could put my kids to bed, and they they were great sleepers. They'd sleep all night, never wake up. Well, I put them to bed one night, and I, and Spencer, my ex, was out working in Ogden, and I had a few friends that I would meet up with here and there and get heroin from and um, go use with. And the cedars were behind our house, and it was basically a bunch of cedar trees in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, I put the kids to bed one night, and and Spencer was um, always calling and checking on me, and, and he would always, like, look, find my iPhone, like, try to see where I was. And I was lying to him a lot, you know, about where I was. Um, I never had an affair or anything like that, um, but I would hang out with one particular guy maybe an emotional affair but it was more drug related right Mm -hmm. anyway put the kids to bed and i met this guy up in the cedars and we smoked some heroin together well spencer's calling my phone and i don't want to tell him where i'm at and so i'm just ignoring his calls and my kids don't ever wake up in the night so i'm like you know it's fine Anyway, this guy that I was using with, we actually went into town to a, another friend's house and, you know, did some drugs there. And meanwhile, Spencer's calling my phone nonstop. And um, I finally get closer to home and I answer the phone. And I'm like, I just had to run to the store to get some milk. <laughs> Who needs milk at like one or two in the morning? But it sounded good. Um, he's like, do you know where your kids are? And this is in the middle of winter. And I'm like, they're home. They're fine. He's like, no, they're not. My kids woke up in the middle of the night and their mom is nowhere to be found. Um, so we're kind of like in a, we have neighbors, but they're not super close. So you have to walk just a little ways to get to a neighbor's house. My three little girls woke up in the night. Their mom is nowhere to be found. And they walk in the snow in their little nightgowns to the neighbor's house to find their mom. And the neighbors had called Spencer. And so Spencer was trying to get a hold of me. And so I go in and try to act like everything was cool. You know, I needed milk. And and they were super cool. Um, they didn't really say much or anything. And I don't know if they really had any idea what was going on. Um, but that was like the first time I could really see it starting to affect me as a mother. You know, I I had started putting everything else before them, you know. And um, so um, then one night his sister would drive by the house just to check on us because she knew Spencer was gone, and she would just drive by at night and check on us. Well... One night she noticed a vehicle that that was there that she didn't recognize. And I had two friends there, a guy and a girl, and their daughter. And my two younger ones, my oldest was at a friend's house, I believe. Anyway, we we had made a meth pipe out of a a Mountain Dew bottle. And um, she notices a car, pulls up, and like... My entryway is was right here, and then, like, around the corner was my garage door, and it would go into the garage, and the garage door was cracked, like, this much. 
one of the guys that was smoking with us walks past the, and my sister-in-law was at the front door and we didn't know, but he walks past the entry door and it had like a side light and goes out into the garage and notices a car out there. So he comes back in and, you know, we're on mess so we're like, oh my gosh, the cops are here. Well, it really was the cops. It was my sister-in-law. She knocked and she saw that pipe that he was carrying. So she comes in and busts us, basically, calls back up. My kids are in bed asleep. They get woke up by the cops taking their mom to jail. And that's where I got my first child endangerment charge. Wow. That's a lot. So much. <laughs> and I can see it's emotional for you. you it know, is. Especially when you're talking about your kids. I mean, you can see it on your face. You can hear it in your voice. Yeah. But and this... I thought I wouldn't, I wouldn't get emotional because I feel like, I feel like I'm healed and I, and I don't have regrets or shame or guilt or anything. But when it comes to my kids. And you said that was your first child endangerment. How, yeah. how many did you end up with? <laughs> Two. Yep. And I, um, so I got that charge and my mom came over and it, <laughs> I got really into rocks when I was on meth. I don't know if you've heard people doing mm. that, but I would go out in my driveway and I would look at all the rocks and try to find all these cool rocks. And like I even took my kids to the elementary school one late at night with flashlights looking for cool rocks. Like I think about it now and I'm like, I don't quite understand it. Yeah, I don't either. Well, there are cool, there are cool <laughs> rocks out there, but I don't think well, you find them in the driveway. Usually. No, and and I was actually looking for rocks in the driveway when my mom pulled up one day to mm -hmm. confront me about what she had heard with this child endangerment charge, and I denied it all, made up a story, and she believed me. Well, two weeks later, this guy that I had gotten high up in the Cedars with um, – I had just picked my little Haley up from preschool and we were on our way home and I told her that I'd go get her a Happy Meal, but she had to pee. So we were going to run home and take her potty. On my way home, this guy calls me and says, Whitney, I have a flat tire. Or I ran, no, I ran out of gas. Will you come pick me up? And so I'm like, okay. Um, and literally, we were not meeting up for drugs. But it, and now I know this, but I didn't at the time. Like the cops were heavy on us; they were watching us pretty hardcore. Um, and I think my sister-in-law had a part in that, which I'm so grateful for today. But um, at the time, I was so upset with her for doing that to me. Like, how could you do that to me? Anyway, so um, we. He was down at the end of this hill, and I pick him up. He puts a gas can in my in my Yukon, and I no longer pull on the road, and cops just surround my car. And I didn't have anything on me, nothing on me. Um, and so they pull us over. They get us out of the car, um, search the car, and they ask, you know, do you have anything on you? And I'm like, no, I don't. And I could say that because I, I knew I didn't. Because um, my plans were to take Haley, you know, and I was good. I didn't, I could use when I got home or whatever. Anyway, so they searched my car, and the guy that was in the car with me took everything he had. So when I was in the car, my f purse was in the front seat, and um, no, it was in the back seat because Haley was up front with me. And um, anyway, I put my purse in the back when the other guy got in the car with me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, long story short, he shoved everything that he had mm -hmm. on him in my purse, yep. and I took the charge. And that's how you snagged the second child endangerment. Mm -hmm. And went to jail. That was my first jail. You're listening <laughs> to the dark days of Whitney Duncan, but every dark day has a light. And we're going to find sure out what does. that light is. Coming up next on Project Recovery. So you end up going to jail. Yeah, I went to jail. A lot of book and releases after that. A lot of them. 
So um, you they they were on your the, the the local police. They knew you were using. You'd gotten these, so they were probably just waiting to get you. And so there were oh, yeah. quite a few times you got arrested and then booked and released. You said. Yep. 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 And then. Um, so that was my second child endangerment charge. I finally sell a house, move out to Ogden with um, my ex and the three girls. Um, and then uh, DCFS finally took my kids away from me at that point. So oh. when we moved out here, they removed them from the home. They were able to go with my family, which I'm so grateful for, and them doing that. Um and at that point in time, like my, our addiction kind of even spiraled were down further because I had no responsibilities. I didn't have any kids. It was all about me. So we could do whatever we wanted. Um, and that was, you know, good until it wasn't. Um, the courts uh, gave me a plea deal. You know, if you don't get any more charges, we'll drop them. And, you know, but I couldn't do it. Uh, we ended up driving to, back and forth to Roseville, like in the middle of the night, selling my pills and would pick up meth out there and stay up all night and drive back home. My siblings knew cops everywhere, basically, and they were in connection with them, and they got us stopped every chance that they could. They knew where we were going, and um, so... I couldn't keep the plea deal, so they they sentenced me. And my ex and I were actually out in Salt Lake, basically homeless for three days on the streets trying to keep well, you know. And I had sentencing, and I my family was like, "You you need we're gonna come get you. You're gonna go." And at that point in time, I was sick and tired. You're being sick and tired. Yep. And so I. I said, okay. So they picked me up at a McDonald's downtown Salt Lake and um, took me home. Um, and I, I saved just a little bit of heroin and did it in the bathtub uh, before I went to court. And I didn't know what was going to happen, um, but they sentenced me to 90 days. Um, and that was really hard for me that I don't belong in jail I mean you look at me I'm not a person that goes that would do well there but it saved my life I needed jail to get clean and sober there was no way I could be away from drugs that long to to withdraw and and get clean so from doing my time there I actually got hooked up um, my attorney had um connections with the women's retreat house in Ogden, Utah. Mm -hmm. And um, I was able to get in there um, and so went straight from jail right to there. And um, I was there for 70 some odd days um, and just, I really enjoyed it. Like I was ready at that time. And so now it comes a process of having to get the kids back, right? And that was easy for me, but not so easy for their dad. Um, he couldn't he couldn't stay clean, um, so I did it on my own. Um, I had to have I was on adult probation parole. I got my cosmetology license taken away because of all my charges. I had all these mountains to climb after you know getting clean and sober. But um, if you want it, you can get it, and I I can testify to that. I wanted these kids back. I wanted my life back. Um, and so I did what I had to do. I attended all my classes. I even went up and managed at the retreat house when I had, you know, enough clean time and tried to help other women, you know. And I've sponsored a few women. Um, and then um, through a series of events and my ex not being able to stay clean, I knew that if I wanted my kids back and I wanted to stay clean, I had to leave him. And that's what I did. Um, and anyway, it took me a year to get my kids back. Um, and I got him back. Um, first time I'd ever been on my own financially. So it was hard, really hard. Um, but the blessings of recovery um, are amazing. Right. So amazing. Like, 
to think where I was, like I didn't even have a car. I didn't have a place to live. I had nothing. Like I was hotel hopping, you know, at the beginning. Um, and now I have, I have a place to live. I have my kids back. Um, an amazing job. Um, amazing relationships in my life. I have a life that I've created that I don't need to ex escape from anymore. And that, to me, it's irreplaceable. And my kids are my reason. Um, <coughs> you know, I, I regret a lot of things that I put them through. Um, but it's so cool to see the unconditional love that your kids have for you. Like, anybody else that I would have done that to would have written me off a long time ago. But because of the love that they have for me, that I want to live my life today for them. I mean, obviously, like, my sobriety comes first, but um, they're a big reason why why I, I stay clean today. And, you know, creating that life you don't need to escape from. Um, I, I don't have any... There's not one time that I think, oh, maybe I should go use some heroin and it'd make it all better. I know that's not going to make it better. I know that. So my mind doesn't go there anymore. I feel like that obsession has been lifted from me. Um, I stay close to God. I remain grateful for everything that I have because I've had nothing before. And so everything means a little bit more to me today. Um, so I just am so grateful for recovery and the blessings and the life that is given me. Um, and we are grateful for you stopping by and sharing your story today. It's a testament to recovery and the power of recovery and unconditional love. So mm -hmm. I think your story is going to help so many out there. And uh, I can't thank you enough for stopping by and sharing it today. Yeah, you're welcome. Dr. Matt? Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming by. And I love kind of the thread of gratitude that you just brought up in there. I think we've talked a lot about the concept of gratitude and how important that is, how beneficial, uh, uplifting, focusing purposefully on gratitude can be. And I think gratitude is in that statement that you said that I've created a life that I don't have to escape from. And I think that's poetic and, and a beautiful example of where you're at. So I, if there's somebody listening out there that wants that, I hope they'll really listen to your story and get the uh, get themselves into a treatment and a recovery program because it's obviously possible. Look at you today. You, I can't it's imagine her impossible. living <laughs> homeless and, and as a, an days. addict. Yeah, no, I can't. So yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. You're Crazy. awesome. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for having me, guys. And thank you for listening. Just in case you forgot, Project Recovery is brought to you by our friends at Know Your Script. And Project Recovery is what, Dr. Matt? It's KSL Podcast.